Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Boston.com's Cocktail Club. I'm Jackson Cannon, and tonight I'll be joined by Doug Capazzoli, bar manager at Brasserie in Boston. Tonight, we're making some holiday cocktails, catching up on the local bar and restaurant scene, and of course, sharing some tips pros use to make great drinks at home. I'm going to go through everything we need for tonight's session, and all the while, we're taking your questions from the chat. First up, we're going to be making a pomegranate champagne cocktail. Uh, for that, I like to use gin with some lemon juice, simple syrup, and a little bit of pomegranate juice. We also need a little sparkling wine to finish that off when we're done. And then we're also going to be making a New Orleans version of milk punch, where you can do either brandy or bourbon, whatever your preference is, um, with a either dairy or a nut milk, uh, simple syrup, and a little grated nutmeg is going to finish that off. Super excited that LG is sponsoring us with their craft cocktail ice. More on that later in the show. Um, but other things that you'll need is some glassware. We're going to do the milk punch into kind of like a, a little low ball like this on, on ice. Um, and we'll do the uh, champagne cocktail either in a flute, if you like uh, that, that narrow thing, or a little white wine glass is kind of nice too. I like the fact that uh, I can get a little bit more of all the different uh, aromas out of that drink in that glass. We'll need something to shake with, shake or set. If you don't have that, a uh, deli container or a mason jar with a lid that seals. Something to measure with. Um, these jiggers are perfect for making kind of a la minute cocktails. It's two ounces over one, three quarters over a half. We're also going to be showing you how to prepare these cocktails in a kind of a little bit larger format ahead of time batching as we say and for that i'll be using my larger oxo uh, mixing cup um, with a funnel and then kind of a large uh you know water bottle or some other kind of repurposed liquor bottle um, goes great for that so for the new orleans milk punch in addition to those things we have our equipment something to strain out the a la minute versions that you're doing and then of course if you're going to grate nutmeg over the top of the drink you need a little micro plane if you don't have that that uh that square cheese grater that um, always fascinated me as a kid. I always just loved that thing. The fine or the middle fine side of that will do great on the nutmeg. Um, I think that's pretty much it for equipment and ingredients. Um, well, you know, Massachusetts native Doug Capazzoli has been tending bar in Boston for over a decade. While attending the University of Massachusetts Amherst, he began his restaurant career and quickly developed a knack for mixing drinks. After graduating with degrees in philosophy and journalism, he moved back to Boston and found spots behind some of the city's most celebrated bars, including the Beat Hotel and Alden and Harlow. Years of pouring an array of rare spirits, creating unique cocktails and working under the tutelage of some of Boston's best gave Doug the solid foundation for the beverage program at Brasserie. There he brings a passion for the craft cocktails and is eager to continue in the tradition of Boston's elevated bar culture. When he's not behind the bar, you can find him at his home in Marshfield fishing, kayaking with his friends and family. Welcome, Doug. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, today was an unseasonably warm day, even though we're making holiday cocktails. Did you get out on the water at all or did you have to work the day away? <laughs> not today, no, I have the kayak uh, boarded up for the season. Uh, so, Nope, but I did walk out my front door in my winter jacket and immediately realized that was a mistake. <laughs> I don't know why I don't look it up every time I do the same. I feel like uh, yeah. I've got a 50-50 chance and I get it wrong more than that. Um, yeah. So, hey, tell us a little bit about Brasserie. Sure. Uh, so we are a younger restaurant. We opened last May. Uh, we're located in the Soa District, uh, downtown Boston, 560 Harrison Ave. Uh, we... Uh, our, our food menu is modern French cuisine, and our uh, bar program is uh, cocktail heavy, um, as uh, craft as we can make it. Uh, you know, definitely I like to say off the beaten path, but approachable is kind of what we strive for. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I'm lucky to be a part of such a great team here, especially in a time where uh, it's difficult uh, to, you know, find people, but we've really accrued a, a tremendous team here. Well, that's exciting. I cannot wait to visit. I'm hearing just great things. Um, you've been running a little bit of a holiday market over there. Yeah. I, so uh, I, I, bring, I bring it up because one of our advanced questions from Ben 
was a rather detailed one about mulled wine. And I thought, ah, as luck would have it been, we're not making bold mulled wine tonight, but uh, we have. Um, I have made, I've made enough mulled wine for uh, several lifetimes. Uh, so across the uh, parking lot, we also have an event space. It's called Power Station. Uh, we, we book it out for private events, and then we also do uh, longer term uh, running events. Uh, we just did a 10 day winter market uh, over there where it was great. Uh, it was uh, really busy. We saw, you know, uh, a couple thousand people in there a day. Uh, kind of picture a, a just boutique, um, you know, market uh, inside. It's, uh, uh, it, was, it was fun. It was cool to see the turnout for it. But yet one of the things that uh, they wanted to do was mold wine. So I was, I was making, well, <laughs> me, me and one of the other managers here, uh, we were making, I, geez, I don't even know how many gallons of mold wine a day. Uh, at all times, we pretty much had five, 10 gallon pots uh, of mold wine going. That's uh, enough to supply a, uh, like a small army. Uh, you would think. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, well, that's great. I, um, I'm getting a little thirsty. I don't know about you. Yeah. Um, so this is a little bit of a weird one, I'll say, for everybody out there. Doug and I decided we wanted to show you at the same time um, kind of an a la minute version of the drink and then sort of a batched version of the drink. So um, our, uh, our, our good friend behind the curtain is going to drop both recipes in the chat. So um, you can follow along with Doug and see him working into a bottle and we'll handle any questions you have about how that gets treated. Um, but I'm going to be working right into the kind of the classic tin on this subtle variation of a, of a, a French 75, which we think of as in the family of champagne cocktails. Even though it has gin, um, the gin is more of an accent of this. The, the, the sparkling wine, the citrus, and the other flavors really do the talking. Um, so I'm going to go, uh, you know, slow enough that Doug can kind of say what he's doing into the bottle. So just uh, we're going to batch enough of the ingredients without the champagne in it that it's something you could keep in the fridge. So if you're worried about, hey, I'm only making a cocktail for myself right now, so I want to do the large format one, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and then that'll keep in the fridge for uh, several days. And we'll tell you how you can excite that and, and serve it again when somebody else is over. So I'm going to start with the base spirit. This is, uh, I'm using Ford's gin. And I'm just going to do one ounce. What do you got? What are you doing over there, Doug? So I am using uh, Roku gin uh, by Centauri. So I think a little bit uh, less of the juniper that you probably have going on on yours and a little bit more um, on this instance, Yuzu. Yeah, that's going to be fun. And then we're just going to do a half ounce each of um, simple syrup. And that's just a one-to-one -one simple. And pomegranate juice. It's 100% pomegranate juice, like a Palm Wonderful or something like that. And a half an ounce of lemon juice. And for me, this is like, you know, the core recipe without the pomegranate juice of that French 75 is really flinty and wonderful. And you're adding a little bit of juice to it that's got some sugar, but pomegranate has like a little bit of a floral quality to it. It has some, it has a, a bit of a bitterness to it. It has some complexity that isn't just adding sweetness. So um, this all kind of balance outs pretty nicely, even though it's incrementally sweeter, it's um, full of really kind of great things. And now for the first, I'm gonna show you again later, but for the first reveal of the mixology craft spheres um, that only LG can provide these to be coming out of your refrigerator um, is what I'm going to be using to uh, to shake mine, and it's kind of fun. It's sort of like using one of those, um, you know, kind of larger hand cut cubes uh, that when you shake just has a lot less dilution. And in a drink like this, actually, we're not looking for a whole lot of water. We need a little bit. And so, since Doug isn't doing that, Doug, how much water did you add in parts to your uh, batch? Uh, three ounces. Awesome. 
added three ounces to, uh, yeah, compensate for the fact that we're not adding ice here and we're not shaking it. Right. So when Doug goes to make his out of the batch bottle, he's just going to be able to shake his. And you'll want to keep that all really nice and cold. And every time you use it, give it a shake. Um, but then uh, he'll be able to pour that out and effortlessly add, effortlessly add some champagne. And it's really a great way. You make a couple of bottles of this and you're having 20 people over. It's really a great way to just be kind of ready to hit it with the sparkling wine. And that will excite the beverage um, and it'll be delicious. So I'm going to give mine a little shake. Oh. I'm just aerating this a little bit as well, making sure everything's integrated. Okay. And I don't need a secondary strainer. That, that large ball of ice has given me integration, dilution, aeration, right? But it hasn't given me any little fragments. It's just kind of rolled around there. And done its job. And now for the fun part. What are you using for sparkling wine, Doug? Uh, I'm using a Cava. Using uh, just Paris Balta Brut. Um, awesome. Mm -hmm. I like that that's a method champenois, but it's just a little lighter and sweeter and not quite as yeasty. I'm using um, Lamarca's Prosecco kind of around for the same sort of reasons. Um, gotta be a little careful. This bottle. Mine actually traveled today, so I'm a little. <laughs> also, I cheated. I cut the foil beforehand. Good man. All right. And then yeah. just topping this off with really kind of to get it all up to like a six ounce pour. So really sort of two to three ounces, depending on your preference. And there we have a really fun holiday version of a champagne cocktail, the classic French 75 done with pomegranate juice. Sparkling wine. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, that is fun. Mm. That's very nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a good one for the holidays. But the color you're looking for, but at this, without being overly sweet, right? You know, it's got that mm -hmm. minerality that I think is so important for like a cocktail that might be kind of stretching from the cocktail hour into the first course. You guys do, uh, you must do a little bit of oysters and such at Brasserie, right, Doug? So we did over the summer. Um, we're not doing them currently, but um, if we were, something like this would go really nice. I mean, I'm just, I'm such a big fan of, uh, you know, fruit cocktails with a fruited component that aren't overly sweet. They're just really well balanced. Uh, you know, you, you find so much that it can so easily go the other way. Uh, mm -hmm. So something like this, where you have the cover that's really just rounding it out. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, just to answer some of our friends' questions, as in almost all kind of these uh, well-architected gin drinks, you know, um, that trade on like citrus and kind of some other flavors. We, we like the botanicals in gin, but it's a clear spirit that's really at the heart of it. So be not afraid. You can easily use vodka as a substitute for this and you'll get a complex, delicious beverage with your spirit of choice. I actually like this uh, flavor profile with a little light rum. Uh, I find that the vanilla really goes mm. well with pomegranate and lemon. Um, so don't, don't worry if you're, you know, if, if you're, if the ginsidant in your past is still so fresh that you're avoiding that particular spirit, we look at those clear spirits as very kind of much more like, um, cousins than, than say they are to, uh, other spirits like say, uh, whiskeys or, or, um, even like aged rums, I kind of put over to a different category than all those light clear spirits that you can kind of you get know, a high degree of, uh, of success kind of subbing those in and out for each other. 
I feel, I feel like Gen 2 is definitely one that has, uh, might be the most polarizing or might have the baddest reputation. Um, I just think the, the people's familiar, uh, it's common to have a singular negative experience with Gen, either because A, you don't quite realize that they're typically much more potent than something like a vodka in terms of alcohol content. Uh, or you're just going with something that's really, you know, hard hitting, London dry, something that's really juniper heavy. And, uh, you know, that might, it's a little too aggressive. And so, didn't, you know, didn't experiment with something that's a little bit more subdued. For a while there, it was sort of like the, the, the twin disasters of young drinking were your experience with tequila and your experience <laughs> with gin. And it was sort of like yeah. a co- kind of a coin flip, which one you were more polarized by. But great tequila has kind of, made this tremendous comeback and agave spirits sure. have penetrated all aspects of the culture and now you you find people willing to say oh i was drinking bad tequila in a bad way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's why i was you know sick for three days as opposed to like they don't give gin the same break yet they're like oh you mean i wasn't supposed to right. have nine gin and tonics on an empty stomach you know like right you know. well and you know i i always like to qualify everything by saying you know i'm not I never like to, uh, I'll never tell somebody what they like and what they don't like. Um, I do try to gently nudge in uh, the direction of maybe exploring something that you haven't tried yet. Um, because the, there is, gin is so uh, uh, vast. There's so many different styles. And it's, it's the type of thing where, it's, to, to your point, where, well, maybe you just, you haven't found the one that you like. Or the way that you like to drink it. Mm-hmm. Well said. Um, hey, so getting a few questions, a little more information on this fantastic, exclusive LG Mixology Ice, and uh, we're really, really grateful for them for sponsoring uh, our event today. So we've, ha- uh, we've got a, a little two-minute video that I think is really going to uh, uh, show you a lot of great uses for this ice, and we're going to play that for you now. LG's exclusive craft ice ice maker automatically makes slow melting round ice at home without the hassle of ice molds. There's no doubt that craft ice will elevate your beverages when you're entertaining, but you'll also find dozens of uses for craft ice every day. Hi, I'm Joe. I've got 20 years of experience tending bar. And just like you, I've also got a life outside the bar. That's why I'm excited to introduce to you the benefits of the new LG craft ice, both for entertaining and for everyday life. So let's dive in and look at the difference between craft ice and conventional ice cubes. With its remarkable size, craft ice is two inches in diameter, making it quite impressive. Bigger than conventional ice, yet smaller than your average whiskey rocks, making it more versatile right out of the gate. It's just the right size for coffee mugs, restaurant style highball glasses, travel mugs, water bottles, whiskey tumblers, you name it, LG has you covered. And because of its size and shape, craft ice is less likely to clump and stick together like regular ice cubes. It also melts more slowly, keeping beverages nice and cold longer without diluting the taste. Watch as I pour hot water over both conventional ice and the LG's craft ice. After waiting one minute, the craft ice has only lost about 37% of its original volume. But the conventional ice has lost 60% of its original volume. That's a big difference. Goodbye watery orange juice, and hello to water that's immediately drinkable but still cold at the end of your workout. LG's craft ice is clearer than conventional ice cubes because the way it's produced reduces the amount of air that normally gets trapped in ice. This clarity is the key to slow melting ice, making your beverage a more enjoyable experience. Well, not to give you all ice envy, but like to their point, the one that I shook with is still sitting here solid in the shaker, which makes this also an exceptional thing for drinking straight spirits on. Um, You know, if I, uh, it it makes me kind of think of what you and your crew go through on a daily basis um, yeah. there. I know that you harvest 50 pound blocks and hit that with a chainsaw. You want to tell people a little bit about we, your ice program? 
Sure. So this is actually, this is a, uh, a technique I picked up from my days at Olden. Uh, what we do, we get about five pounds of 50 block, uh, uh, 50 pound blocks of ice in a week. And yeah, we cut them down with a chainsaw. Uh, we run the chainsaw off of, uh, you know, fruit safe butcher block oil. Uh, but yeah, it, it takes us about 40 minutes to cut a block. Uh, believe it or not, it's actually, we find it to be the, uh, most time effective way of doing it actually, as opposed to using molds. Uh, but definitely the, uh, uh, LG spheres, that is, uh, that would definitely, uh, help us, I think, <laughs> or definitely uh, cut down on time. Yeah. I'm going to look into that. I know it's for domestic, uh, use, but you know, yeah, it does, it does make one wonder. I, I, I've traveled in Spain for wine and, and, and cocktails before, and they have this ice kind of everywhere you go. And it's not because everybody has the same ice machine that they, they sort of like centralize that. So a lot of the towns are kind of small and there's like a place where you get ice from and they have the mm. same ice machine. And it's basically like these long tubes of ice that are sliced and huh. It's one of those things like people ask me, like, why does the Spanish gin and tonic tradition like have such gravity? And there are a few different reasons for um, for the love of gin being expressed that way in the culture. But one is that everybody has these ice cubes that are basically um, not spherical like this, but about this density. Right. So like two or three of them in a glass in the hot Spanish summer don't melt before you finish your gin and tonic. Um, mm -hmm. and that's just kind of like how they roll, even like a place that is, doesn't have mixology per se, right. Just has sort of straight drinks, like has this ice. And, um, that was sort of one of the first things I thought about this. I was like, I kind of actually, I can't wait to have a rum and tonic on this, you know, like, sure. um, I sure. bet it'll be there. Like I'll be able to have a couple of them without having to add a bunch more ice. Um, well, that's the best this. part about having cubes like that. Yeah. Folks were asking us a little bit before we get into the next drink, are asking a little bit of follow-up questions about um, about gins. And Doug, they're curious, what are some of your favorites that don't have um, a high juniper profile that maybe if that's what's putting them off, um, sure. that they can get into? I, so what I used uh, for the pomegranate champagne cocktail, uh, Roku gin, uh, definitely going to be up there. The juniper, it's it's there, uh, but it's not quite as aggressive. Um, again, the other aromatics or botanicals that are going on in there uh, as a nice green tea flavor profile. It has a nice yuzu flavor profile. Uh, so something like that, uh, and especially for the price point of it, I mean, you're looking at a, a spirit that's going to be about under $30. Uh, also, I mean, a classic and one of my personal favorites, uh, Plymouth. Uh, definitely going to have a substantially subdued uh, juniper component to it. It's a, you had a reaction. It seems like you're fond of uh, Plymouth. I just love that texture, especially like yeah. stirring that. It, it's funny. I like the juniper to kick through a lot of things like a fine and dandy or an aviation sure. or a drink like that. Yeah. When I stir a martini, like I want some, but I really like um, that kind of concert. It's one of the reasons I use Fords so much is it, it has enough for that shakeability of like a beef eater, but it has that stirability yeah. of Plymouth for me. And then yeah. kind of one that I'd like to throw out there. I know it's a big brand and I know people don't think about it, um, but Tangeray's number 10 with its yep. just compound layers of citrus flavors. You know, it, it's just beautiful. Like you taste that in the blind and it's like a symphony of orange over lemon, over grapefruit, over lime. It's all there. Really pretty. When I'm giving, um, you know, my spiel about uh, give gin a chance, um, that is normally what I'll pour somebody, uh, uh, something with Tank Ray 10, some spirit driven cocktail that utilizes that. Uh, um, I mean, a Tank Ray 10 martini with just a twist of lemon on it. I, that's, that's one of my favorite warm weather uh, cocktails. Right. How about that? Yeah. Well, hey, getting back to prepping, making and enjoying holiday cocktails. We're going to both make a NOLA milk punch at the same time. So not a clarified milk punch that takes days and is amazing, but uh, just this kind of blunt, pleasureful glass of milk. Um, I'm going to make mine with brandy and with a non-dairy substitute. 
and I'm going to be doing the batch version. What are you rolling on to make the a la minute version? Yes. Uh, uh, so I am using um, whole milk as the dairy. Uh, and then instead of cognac, I'm using bourbon. And I'm going to be using, uh, I don't know if you can see the bottle there, uh, Elijah Craig small batch. Because you can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, it's a little bit higher of an ABV. Uh, it's about 94 proof. So it's probably going to be a little bit punchier. Uh, but I figured something like this, uh, since we're already uh, finishing with grated nutmeg, there is those toasty notes that are in here, I figured would complement that really nicely. Um, yeah. So it's funny, we're making an either or on this. And uh, I was talking with my friend, Chris Hanna, who owns Jewel of the South in New Orleans. And he says they treat an order for New Orleans milk punch like an old fashioned. They, they ask, do you want brandy or oh. want brandy or bourbon? But I'm yeah. reminded of all those tests with the Sazeracs, right? Where it was like, it's rye, but like, let's try it with cognac. And then like, let's go split base. Nobody's mm -hmm. gone that far yet, but now I'm finding myself curious about like a split base. <laughs> then, then you're, you know, split base, sure. maybe a little, uh, a little Jamaican rum, but that's the story for another day. Let's go through measure by measure here. And I'm going to build mine in the batch bottle while you build yours in a shake. What do you got? All right, I'm gonna start with two ounces of the Elijah Craig small batch. I'm gonna do eight ounces of Pierre Ferrand's cognac. All right, and then I have actually, instead of just uh, regular simple syrup, I have a little bit of a vanilla simple. Which nice. is just as easy to make. Uh, my specs for uh, doing this, I mean, vanilla extract, I'm sure we all know a little goes a long way. Uh, so for a pint, I really just use about a, a scant half ounce. I mean, like a mid shot between um, a quarter and a half. It was interesting to see when I was looking up old recipes, Doug, that uh, there are a couple out there that say just to add a little vanilla extract right, right into the cocktail. I was like, yes, sure. that's brave. Yeah. All right. And now for my uh, dairy component here, I'm just going to add four ounces of whole milk. I'm going to do 16 ounces of a, of a non-dairy milk. It's a coconut almond blend, which I find has a really good texture for substituting into drinks like this. Now, one of the things both Doug and I did was batch into a bottle larger than what we were making, giving us a little airspace so we can just shake the bottle to do our mixing. I'm going to use one of my uh, chainsaw cubes here. And I'm going to use... Uh, Craft ice by LG, but I'm going to shake off of it here in this bottle. Now I can keep this in the fridge, and this will last weeks. Um, and I don't have to serve a full portion. If I want to just take a little sip or a shot, I can. Uh, I'm having dairy envy. I can't. I can't drink regular dairy, but look at that beautiful foam coming out of that cocktail. I think lastly, we got the nutmeg here. I mean, it smelled great before, but that is, I'm a sucker for, I don't, I'm a sucker for dairy cocktails. I don't think, yeah, you know, like, cheers. Cheers. Hmm. Well, I mean, a lot's been written about that drink as a, uh, as a brunch drink, as a recovery sure. kind of drink. 
but sure. I don't think you can deny its nightcap ability and or yes. it's sort of like, I mean, it's sitting at the bar at four o'clock, having one of these with you is wrong. I don't want to be right, you know? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, And also these make, uh, since you can store them, uh, what I like to do, I like to make them. And if there's like a, a, a Yankee swap or something, um, I, I love to make stuff like this and give them as gifts. Um, yeah, you can do a, just a, a simple little label on there, giving people the instructions. Um, oh, pleasurable. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I know with the, with the nut milk, it's, I, I, I'm comfortable keeping this in the fridge up to maybe two weeks on the outside. With the dairy, uh, how long would you feel comfortable? I mean, for me, they improve for a little bit of time, for a couple of days, but after right. that... Um, I would three, I would say three, four, possibly depending, uh, unless what, what do you think? Yeah, same. I mean, after, uh, you, you can always check it. I mean, it's, uh, sure. it's milk in the fridge, which lasts for weeks. Um, it's not, it's been, it's, a, it's had sugar added, which is a preservative. It's had alcohol added, which is an antiseptic, you know? So, um, it's just about really the vibrancy of the drink for then. Uh, you know, the safety, obviously it wouldn't be something like over, you know, past the expiration point of the milk you would want to be drinking. So I feel right. like you have kind of a, a, a window of two weeks where for a few days, it's getting better for a few more days. It's great for a few days after that. It's sort of like fading a little bit in flavors. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's sort of like, Hey, it's time to move on. Right. Hmm. Well, Doug, thank you so much for, being here with us on Cocktail Club. It's just really a treat to get you on and can't wait to visit your bar. I wanted to tell everybody that in lieu of taking tips in the Venmo, uh, you asked us to put up Toys for Tots. So there's information on how to donate there in the chat. You uh, enjoyed Doug and we're gonna slip him a couple of bucks. Why don't you give that to that great charity uh, this time of year. Everybody needs a little bit of help um, so we can make that happen. I, uh, I wanna say thanks so much to uh, LG and their craft ice. That's all the time we have for cocktail club. Our next club is at the end of the year. It's on uh, January 30th. It's a daiquiri timeout with a whole host of cocktail club alumni. Um, you won't want to miss that. So follow us on uh, globe events on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter for more information about um, other cocktail club events. You can find me also on uh, those platforms at Canon Jacks real special. Thanks to you, Doug. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jason. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. Happy holidays.